places today and welcome to another inaugural lecture today our the lecturer the professor dr ready silva and uh, i first uh, cordially invite uh, professor kamake for to interview our inaugural lecture today good afternoon everyone uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you uh, to you the speaker today professor chatupur ganjati silva my good friend um, colleague and partner in many adventures in the realm of cyberspace so uh, professor chatupur had his education at royal college uh, belong to the group uh, that covered their studies in 1988 that is uh, three years junior to me in school and graduated with the first class honors degree from the university of moratura specializing in computer science and engineering professor chatupur completed a masters in engineering degree from the nanyang technological university uh, better known as ntu in singapore in 1999 there he designed a custom processor for a chess playing robot uh, cutting edge robotics work at that time uh, thereafter professor chatupur continued his doctoral research at the national university of singapore in us uh, obtaining a phd in 2003 his phd research was ahead of the technology curve at that time and was on facial expression recognition from a single image as you all know quite aware nowadays we do that with compute heavy deep learning models that's how we do it this uh, these days but at his time it was the work of innovative design algorithms um then prof chatur joined the csd department in 1996 and Uh, that is before going for his uh, postgraduate studies and has continuously uh, been in the department and he has contributed tremendously to its growth and improvements bringing in resources such as the center for instructional technology and more recent the huawei innovation lab they serve both the university its administration the teaching staff as well as the student community he was the head of the department from Uh, mid 2014 to uh, mid 2017 so um, <clears throat> while uh, professor chatur did his usual service at the university teaching undergraduate and postgraduate courses um, mainly the courses he taught touched hardware uh, such as microprocessor based systems and computer vision but his greatest contributions are in leading the digitalization of several key public institutions in this country now every second student who passed the gc advanced level in sri lanka and who wish to enter a state university to pursue an undergraduate degree now has a hassle free fully online fully digital um, application process it used to be a cumbersome process lot of paper you no know, form filling with lot of errors now all that is good in the past so this project was led by prof chatur from conception to the roll out um he even wrote some of the code himself um and did a lot of the back end server management himself um in this project uh, i have had a front row to see how he developed it uh, he was ably assisted by the um the current secretary to the ugc uh, in a just grand commission dr priyanka kumar um another uh, 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 signature achievement uh, from prof chatur is connecting uh, is connecting an a very archaic government department to be a leading e government service provider that is the department of immigration and immigration uh, so nowadays when you submit an application to obtain a passport that is a thick sheet of paper still you have to submit but they give it back to you right away so while you are still you no know, uh, paper bound the government is paperless and fully digital so this is another project that was led by prof chatur to um, he introduced many innovative uh, process engineering methods working uh, with the uh, department and uh, you no know, he uh, did this work with the uh, able collaboration of the uh, 
um, head of the issue at that time and the current uh, secretary of the Ministry of Education, Mr. Nihal Ram Singh. So the list of uh, these projects that uh, Prof. Chakura did, um, you know, being a leading ICT consultant in Sri Lanka, is quite long. So while that list is very long, his knowledge and expertise uh, made uh, many things short. Okay, for example, um, when you see, you know, if you are passing in the Modra area, you will see actually a shorter queue for containers at the port of Colombo. So that that is our main gateway for export ex, uh, import the country. Um, so that is due to the contribution from Prof. Chatura for the implementation of a non-invasive container inspection system for Sri Lanka. Um, so that kind of work which he did uh, at the customs keep those steel boxes moving quite smoothly. So um, without doubt, Prof. Chatura is the leading e-government um, and government system utilize expert in our country. So this is something we all can be very proud of and uh, you know, be very happy as he is our colleague. Um, yeah. So th there are a lot of things that I can talk about, but uh, no, I think I'll stop my introduction now. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, Prochatra will not have any time or any content to deliver as his talk. Um, but today, Prochatra will speak about uh, an activity which he was involved for over 15 years. Uh, so, Prof. Chatura is the um, ICT consultant to the United Nations on border management technology. Uh, now, for, for 15 years, uh, he has been providing the consultancy and expertise for implementation, implementation verification, designing of systems, and advising governments um, throughout the region from Middle East to South Pacific. And he has received many awards and recommendations for his work. In, in, in fact, in 2017, Prof. received a special merit recognition award from the World Customs Organization for the services he rendered to the customs community. Uh, so that is the kind of global recognition he has. Um, so with a person with such knowledge and expertise, I think we'll be able to receive a very interesting inaugural speech. So ladies and gentlemen, May I please invite Prof. Chatur de Silva, Professor in Computer Science and Engineering, to deliver his inaugural speech. Thank you. Thank you, Shantana, for that uh, introduction. Uh, and also, good afternoon to everyone uh, joining online and uh, at least here. Uh, so, I hope you all can see my screen now, slides now, and uh, let me start on my presentation on seems to be an interesting topic. and where I will talk about what you will see and what you are not seeing when you travel abroad. Uh, nowadays, traveling abroad, abroad uh, is not a, I mean, it's a very common thing. I mean, if you take uh, uh, about every year, about 6 million Sri Lankans uh, travel abroad, uh, move across our, uh, our borders in uh, multiple airports. Of course, now, nowadays it's somewhat less because of the COVID situation, but uh, that was the traffic volume that we were handling, uh, uh, I mean, uh, before COVID. So, typical process would take more, you would get a visa, because most of the countries would require Sri Lankans to have a prior visa uh, before reaching their borders. So, we'll apply for a visa, get the visa, and then uh, purchase a ticket, or vice versa, we might purchase a ticket and then apply for visa also. Uh, and then, uh, check in, get on board, and arrive at the destination, and uh, get clearance, and then leave. So this will be a seamless process for most of us if you travel now. But if you compare this with uh, what happened about 20 years back, it was not seamless as today. Uh, because the travel industry was completely governed by paper-based documents at that time. So when you apply for visa, you need to give a lot of documents, uh, usually certified copies, you need to get them certified by lawyers, certified by issuing institutions like banks, or you have to get, get certain uh, documents certified by the foreign ministry, the consumer service division, and then submit it to the embassy. Multi usually it will require multiple visits. And once we get the visa, visa will come in form of a stamp in, you know, uh, in your passport. And once you get that visa, you go and purchase the ticket, and again for that you need to visit a travel agent. Agents, most travel agents ask you to bring cash for the payment. I mean, online payments are not popular at that time. And fortunately, the rupee was uh, at a higher value, so you can carry that cash in your pocket rather than in a shopping bag like nowadays. So, uh, but you had to pay that, make the payment. And when you purchase the ticket, you would get a small booklet. 
ticket fees was a booklet with a couple of pages in them. And then at, at the airport when you travel, there will be a lot of security checks. Because the security will open up your bag and examine what is in what you are carrying in any, any, any item that is dangerous to the aircraft and the travel. Uh, then the customs will inspect your bag again. Uh, to see whether you are taking any contraband or anything prohibited uh, to be exported from Sri Lanka. And then you go to a checking counter, they will check your visa, they will check your passport, they will check your ticket, ask you questions from you, and then you go to immigration counter, they will repeat the same checks again, and then finally get on board the aircraft. And then the process almost reversed, all the steps has to be followed and arrive at the destination as well. But today, if you look at, travel is seamless. We apply for visa online. Embassies won't see you, at least, uh, I mean, uh, before, in most of the embassies, before they issue the passport, uh, issue the visa. I mean, in certain countries, certain situations, you might be asked to come for an interview, but in most cases, it will not be. And you might submit a photograph of you, but again, they don't know whether it's your photograph or someone else's photograph that you are attached to your application, because you are not seeing in person. Then booking is done online, you pay through credit card, again, you get a ticket, now as an email confirmation, not, not, not no any physical document. And then online, you can check in online and simply you can drop your baggage at the airport, uh, bag drop, and then go to immigration. Sri Lanka is, has just started the baggage drop. I mean, we were not having baggage drop earlier because of the visa requirements, but now for certain countries it is provided. And uh, then on the arrival also, if you have access to e gates, you don't need to wait in a counter. You simply walk through the e gate, collect your baggage, and go. So it looks like it's kind of a any hassle free as well as any. I mean, security free, I mean, checks free. But it's not the real case that that happens when you travel. So that is what you experience. But what happens behind the screen? Right? Now, when you apply for a visa, you will see that you have to submit to an online application, log in and submit information. And within a couple of hours or within days or within weeks, you get the visa approval or rejection or the other ones. But what you don't see there is what happens behind. When you apply your, for your visa, the the receiving country the, from the country that which, for which you are applying visa will do a first will do a do a build up a profile against you are traveling to that country against looking at the threats and the risk involved. Profile building will involve collecting a lot of data about you from your application and many other multiple sources. In most cases, they will look at will search for you in your social media accounts. They search for you in Google. And then build up a profile to see who you are and what you are like to do in that country. And they will look for your political affiliations, uh, social engagement, etc. And whether those things will be any potential risk or threat to that country. And also they will look at who are associating with you. I mean, if you are going to a certain place, put a photo, get a, get a kind of photograph, put that photograph in your Facebook, that might affect your this application in certain cases, depending on where you are visited. And then also they will make an assessment whether you are going to be a burden to their, their country. I mean, whether you are going to be a burden for the society or the government in terms of welfare benefits. And based on that, they will issue your visa. Now, getting a visa, so they have all your records with them and they send you an email saying that, okay, your visa has been approved and this is the reference number. But getting a visa does not guarantee that you can enter that country. I mean, that happens at the travel agency. And also for the government by issuing a visa, they know that you have an intention to travel, but they don't know when you are coming or with whom you are coming. So those checks happen at a later stage. When you purchase a ticket, we think that we go to a travel agent, travel agent make the booking, or we go to a website directly online or ticketbooking.com or ticket.com or something like that, and we purchase the ticket. We think that we provide our information to that agent who is at front desk, but really that is not what happening. I mean, tickets are issued by some of the global systems, and these systems are connected to security and enforcement agencies worldwide. So when you make a reservation, a record called PNR record, passenger name record, is created in that system. And that record has all your details. And that is linked to your previous travel records as well. You may not declare by the, by the travel ticketing, but from data, they can uh, link you to other travels. So that information is usually shared with the board agencies in the countries that your travel itinerary includes. So those agencies would know that you, are, you would probably come there because you have made a reservation, not just the ticket yet, but you have made a reservation, so they are aware that you are coming and they can search for more information. 
and then also these systems also share this data with commercial entities for commercial gains. And that's why when you purchase a ticket, when you get the email uh, through Google uh, or through a Gmail account, you'll also see that it is being automatically updated in your Google calendar. And you will start receiving a lot of advertisements, offers, etc., in the destination country uh, which match your uh, I mean, travel time. So all this happens because this information is also shared with these commercial entities on a commercial basis. And then uh, at the airport when you travel, uh, you go, uh, you might decide to check in online. Now, once you check in online, the destination country knows now you are coming. Earlier, they only knew that you had intention to travel. Now they know that you are coming. So again, the government machinery will start, the intelligence machinery and the security machinery will start profiling you again. They will look for you. They will uh, uh, profile you in multiple ways. Your travel, your security, your health, everything will be profiled. And very often, a decision might even be taken whether to allow you to come to that country or not. Certain countries, for example, in Australia, when you check in, your information is shared with that uh, destination country and they take a decision, individual decision about you, whether to allow you to come there or not. And that decision is taken within seven seconds and relate back to the check-in agent, either the airport counter or the online check-in agent. And if they, 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 they might uh, give a negative determination, in which case you will not be allowed to check in and you will be, uh, I mean, further process to see what they can do. So, if, if decision can be happened at even at that, that level. So, if you are allowed to go in, then also, depending on the security profile of you, I mean, the, the security profile building is done at both at the source and also destination country. When the source country security profile will sometimes mandate you to be watched while you are in the airport. If uh, the security staff will watch you over the CCTV, and see what you are doing, with whom you are associating with, where you go, and everything will be watched if you are a, a target in that uh, security profile. And then uh, your baggage will be scanned uh, by X-ray, uh, uh, one-dimensional X-ray or two-dimensional X-ray, or sometimes even uh, based on CT technology, uh, depending on the security profile for the aviation security. I mean, most of the security is looking at the safe from the aircraft. So, from the aviation security perspective, your baggage will be scanned again, and also, you will, well, in most cases, you will be checked against databases held by the international police or Interpol. Uh, because Interpol maintains certain databases of people who are issued with red notices, various other uh, involvements. Your data will also be shared with uh, Interpol. And if you are in the, one of those lists, sometimes, sometimes it might happen that your name is there, but it's not you, but a similar name might be having there in, in the database. In that case, you are again uh, questioned or interviewed again to see what happens. And also your travel itinerary that you declare the visa and the uh, the uh, ticket purchase. In certain cases, that might be verified. For example, if you declared a hotel reservation, should a reservation reference, they will check out. I mean, automatically to be checked with the reservation in that uh, particular hotel to see whether. Now, some of these things, if this check fails, might uh, lead you to be questioned at the uh, check-in gate, or some of these it's simply indicative. Uh, they will not take any action based on that. So this is what happens behind. Now, the challenge is how we do that, how people do that, because it looks a lot of things. I mean, you see a very seamless travel, but behind the scenes, there are many things that happen. So how the technology has helped. To understand the significance of this problem, let's look at some statistics. Um, if you look at World Bank data, the total air passenger travel, this is excluding very short distance travel, I mean, mostly international air, uh, I mean, air travel, um, this shows the trend. Right? The, uh, so by 2019, about 4 billion people did air travel. Uh, I mean, most of them are between countries. And uh, of course, see, after 2019, there was a decline because of obviously the COVID, but so we have to look at the statistics before that. So globally, 4 billion travelers. In South Asian region, it is about 100, over about 170 million travelers. In Sri Lanka, we had a about 4.5 million air travelers. And the revenue they generate, because most of them are associated with the tourism sector, globally, it's, a, it's almost a $2 billion uh, industry. Uh, and South Asia, it is about $40 million industry. And Sri Lanka, it's about $6 million industry. And uh, so if we look at 
I mean, the six million dollars is one something that we missed during the COVID, and that is one reason for this economic crisis. So, if we uh, look at these volumes, the number of passengers who are involved in this process, etc., having these checks is a very difficult task. Okay, so how technology can help in assisting this? So before going into that, let's look at some of the requirements, some of the challenges when we deal with this type of uh, environment. Right? Now, when it comes to border management, for any government, border management is very important component in their security infrastructure. The main reason is that without, I mean, the, the territory of the country would become insecure. Now, at the same time, country's economy would also depend on the border, because there are many things that uh, people would that, that would happen across borders in doing in handling this. Now, these challenges as opportunities, right? So, for example, cross-border tra traveling is, I mean, involves uh, combating transnational crime. If you look at most of the organized crimes uh, happening, a large scale organized crimes that happens today, I mean, they are transnational crimes. And also they are linked with various other things. For example, someone smuggling humans, right? I mean, taking people to some other country without a proper authorization might also be linked to money laundering because that involves money, right? And it might involve in uh, transfer of illicit items, contrabands or drugs, etc. Now, just to give an example, now, uh, until recently, I mean, before this economic crisis starts, Sri Lanka had duty free for in, uh, I mean, bringing in gold. I mean, you could bring 10 kilograms of gold with you in an aircraft, declare, show it to the customs, declare it to the customs, and without paying a single cent as duty, you could have taken it away. But even with that, people tried to smuggle gold through various means. Right? Why is the reason? Because if you bring gold and if the customs sees that, then the next question is that how did you get money to bring that? Right? So that links to how you earn money, whether you are paying taxes for that, all those network is there. So because of that, even things that are le legitimate to bring, which need to be declared, smugglers try to do without that. So all these things poses challenges to board officers. I mean, when a passenger comes to an immigration counter or customs counter, within a couple of seconds, they have to check all these things and take the decision. It's not an easy task. At the same time, there's also other pressure coming from the commercial aspect of that, opportunities. For example, border facilities international trade. I mean, without a smoothly operating, operating border, you can't have international trade. And economies can't run without international trade these days. And it promotes investments. Uh, investor, when it comes to a particular country, but one of the first things that you look at is how efficient the immigration and customs processes are. Because, I mean, we need to bring money, we need to bring goods, we need to take this profit back. So all those things require facilitation. And also it stimulates tourism. Uh, a tourist would expect a very easy passage to the border. I mean, they don't want to wait in queues for a couple of several hours before getting into a country. And it supports uh, this labor mobility. Uh, labor migration is a big part of the economy these days. And also uh, collaboration that comes for economic growth and security. Now, there are these two types where, on one side, we would look at facilitation. We, we see how we can facilitate people to travel through the, the uh, borders very easily without any, has a, has a lot of uh, delays. Now, especially when, you come, when we look at the drivers like uh, airlines, tourism industry, trade business, etc., they push for this facilitation. I mean, they would want traveler to be safety. They look at the traveler's safety, not the, uh, the uh, surrounding environment safety, but they look at the traveler's safety. They would uh, like to have minimum checks, minimum interventions, minimum questions being asked, uh, and increase the capacity of airlines and aircrafts, etc. All these facilitations come from one side. On the other side, the security establishments who are involved in maintaining the national security and border security would, would, would like to have more checks because they are responsible for the security. When a passenger is without any checks, that carries a risk. So they would like to have more inspections, more security, more security of passengers and their goods. And also sometimes they would like to have the physical presence in borders with barriers so that because that creates the mindset of a secure environment and difficulty in smuggling. So, so these two are two extreme means. 
and there's always a battle between if you look at the installations and the projects that we have done, I mean, if you look at these two battles are there. When you try to put some control, there's one side who say you don't need that control, and there's the other side who depends on that control. So if you look at specific our border, Sri Lanka, because these, these things are different from country to country. So in terms of the modern border management, uh, a, a proper functioning border is a border which remains open and convenient for legitimate uh, movements, but remain closed for illegal activities. Now, to do this, we need to identify what, to whom it should be open, to whom it should be closed. And that depends on many factors. We look at, for example, uh, the type of border related, uh, I mean, threats in Sri Lanka, I mean, uh, not in Sri Lanka, I mean, any country which has, which has our environment, our economy, and type of economy, et cetera, would face. I mean, there will be criminal people who are threatened to the national security. I mean, there will be people who think that, okay, getting into the country like this and staying there hidden from the world is much easier than, than in some other countries. And there will be people who are internationally wanted uh, for various uh, crimes and other things and still try to come in the US. And there will be internationally wanted terrorists who are trying to come and operate within these countries. And there are people who are involved in this human smuggling. Human smuggling is next to the, the drug smuggling, actually. It's a huge market, a huge, huge market in the world, record in the world. And then uh, there are the people who are trying to damage the national uh, image or the national identity of that particular country. And people might enter as tourists, but do various other work, right? I mean, they, they, they come and do businesses. I mean, if you see most of the scammers on who have taken money from ATMs, etc. I mean, they were not Sri Lankans. I mean, they are foreign operatives. I mean, who came from here as tourists and then do these things. So likewise, there are many, many uh, threats. Even a country, I mean, like Sri Lanka would face in terms of border. And if you take a more developed economy, the threats will be even larger. Right? So how do we handle that? And that's where the technology comes into the picture. And the today's context is that we need to have smart borders. Where the technology will drive how the border is managed. Now, again, when we look at the two pressures, facilitation and more security checks, right? A smart border usually says that you need to focus on facilitation, not on control. The reason is that if you can facilitate good passengers, because if you look at the total passenger volume, statistically over 95% of the passengers are good passengers. Only 5% is one who, is, who, is, who, is, who possesses a risk for the threat. Right? So if you can use the technology, either you can use the technology to find those 5% and I mean protect against them, you can put your all effort doing that, or you can put, use technology to facilitate the 95% to have a more convenient travel. So the smart border concept extends to that area and says that, okay, you should always focus on facilitation of good passengers and allowing them a seamless free uh, and minimally invasive movement across the board. By doing that, I mean, if you can use the technology to do that, I mean, with minimum human intervention, you are leaving board officials with time and focus to target on the potential bad files. So we automate good passengers, but keep targeting bad passengers for the officers who will experience. So that's, 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 that's the idea behind this smarter border, smarter border technology. And also, this leverage on information rather than physical documents and physical checks. So to be non-invasive, you leverage on information, whatever you can collect, whatever you declare, rather than asking them to produce documents and any physical examinations. Obviously, this has to be risk-driven because when, whenever you try to take a decision based on information that you have, there's associated risk because the information may not be correct. If the information is wrong, your decision will also be wrong. So there's a risk. So you need to have a risk managed approach in doing that. You have to get calculated risk in allowing that. When you decide to passenger, when you apply for a visa without going to the embassy, you apply it online and give you all details. Uh, I mean, there, there's certain risk that, I mean, it may be someone else uh, impersonating you and trying to get that document. So you need to have a calculated risk to take that decision before allowing you to issue the visa or not. So likewise, there should be a risk management approach into that. And also, there's a concept of exporting the border. That means traditionally we applied control at our own borders. We wait until they come to our borders and then take the decision. Now the technology, uh, with, and also when you take information-driven technology, we can do it at the point of departure. If someone is coming from 
country like to Sri Lanka, we can check his suitability or admissibility to our country while he is at point X. Even before he leaves his own country, we can take that decision. And in some cases, even prevent it. Uh, there are systems called advanced passenger information systems and advanced passenger processing systems. Advanced passenger information systems concept provide information about the passenger to the destination country or the transit country when he is at the uh, point of departure. So they can be prepared. In advanced passenger processing systems, you even give back the decision to the uh, source country and the airline, especially, uh, to take him on board or not uh, towards the destination uh, country. And also, smart borders let people, the officers, to stay behind the screen with minimum visibility so that ensures their own safety as well as uh, uh, create a more free environment in the border areas, in airports and uh, seaports. And this became very important, especially after COVID, because now uh, what uh, smart borders is talking about is touchless travel. I mean, whenever you have physical contact, physical information, that's a risk of health, health risk, uh, contamination, etc. So if you can have completely non-invasive mechanisms driven remotely, that means you have touchless travel that uh, reduces the health risk to a minimum amount. Uh, then uh, uh, they can also use minimum, minimally uh, invasive technology, for example, RFID baggage tech. Now, when you travel to Dubai or Abu Dhabi, actually, at the airport, uh, when they unload their bags, uh, um, when you travel, you see that then there's no checks, there are no custom checks, nothing. You simply pick up the bag and go. But the moment you unload your bag from the aircraft, it goes through at least three X ray scans and different levels. And if your bag is supposed to be having something uh, suspicious, they want to check that one, they will put a small RFID sticker, place a small RFID sticker in your bag. And after that, when you are in the airport, so you might not go straight away out, you might go to a washroom, you might go to a beauty shop or whatever. They track where you go. And at the point of leaving the airport, there are some indicators. There will be some plain clothes officers and uniformed officers. The indicator will flash that you have been tagged. They will call you for an inspection and they will check your baggage. So even though if you think that you are moving very freely, through technology, the suspected passengers are being uh, tracked in the airport. So these technologies can help a lot. And also, in today's context, uh, there are more than one name. Traditionally, if you look at uh, the border was a business of customs and immigration. But if you look at today's, uh, with security concerns, health concerns, and other things, there are multiple agencies who has an interest on the border operation. So imagine uh, everyone want to inspect your bag and or, or ask questions from you. If you take Sri Lanka, we have 14 different agencies who has an interest on the border. I mean, they operate independently, not, not as one entity. In some countries, uh, I mean, they form new entities. For example, after 9-11 attack, for example, if you look at uh, uh, Australia, uh, I mean, they combine customs and immigration together and create the Australian border force. Same with UK, same with US, Customs and Border, border Protection uh, Agency. Uh, in, in Singapore, we have the check, uh, checkpoint, uh, Immigration and Checkpoint Authority. I mean, they are, they are the front line who interact with the passengers, whereas the immigration customs work behind them. Uh, without direct interaction. But countries like Sri Lanka, India, especially South Asian countries, due to our administrative and political uh, uh, structures and various other things, we can't do that. So we still have immigration separately, customs separately, uh, health quarantine separately, uh, narcotics operating separately, and the terrorist immigration department operating separately at the board. So imagine everyone want to ask questions from you. Right? So that's not practical. So another approach in, uh, I mean, concept in the smart borders is that we have an integrated approach where you have one front line, either technical or physical, or even only one or two agencies, traditional agencies, but everyone else can work behind, but still have the same control and same uh, intervention where, where, where necessary in the border operations. Then, uh, so how we put everything together in a, in, in a, in a, in a solution? So typically, uh, it's data driven, right? The decision is taken based on risk, uh, but to take a risk-based decision, you need data. And that data can come from multiple sources. So when you apply for a visa, or when you apply for an electronic visa, uh, or ETA, uh, or when you, uh, when, when, you, when, you are, when you are granted with uh, approval for that, when you buy an airline ticket, all this data is shared with relevant authorities. And in fact, uh, there's a resolution 
section in UN, UN Security Council called uh, Solution 16, which mandates airlines to share that data with uh, law enforcement agencies in uh, re respective countries. So airlines can't say that they cannot share uh, cer certain data attributes. And also, most countries will have their own data sources like immigration databases, the uh, Ministry of Fine, I mean, Foreign Affairs and uh, database, the airport operational databases, the airlines will uh, have certain databases of people. I mean, likewise, there are many data sources that they can collect. But on the other, at the same time, there are, in most countries, there are data protection and uh, privacy protection rules as well. I mean, you can't simply collect data from people in most countries with legislation, even though these agencies want to collect that data, they are not permitted to do that. In most cases, for example, if you take European uh, General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR, that does not allow information to be collected, even for asking for information that can become an offense unless there's a probable cause for that. So someone simply applying for a visa or uh, making a reservation, in non-competing reservation on the airline does not mean there's a probable cause because he might do it, he might travel or not travel. So as a result, this collected data in most of the countries are held in systems in protected way in, in, in non-visible way, non-accessible way, under a framework of protecting and controlling exposure. So, so even though we collect a lot of data at, at, at various points, they may not be available for risk-driven decision-making at those times. But once you check in, once you get on board an aircraft, now that, that is guaranteed, unless the aircraft crashes, and is guaranteed uh, that you will arrive in that particular board. Now that creates a probable cause. So from that point, the data become available to the board agencies. But the issue is that to, for that decision to be taken, you have only very limited time. In some countries, the minimum travel time between a, a foreign destination could be about a couple of hours. But if, for example, if you take Sri Lanka, it can be very short. I mean, from India, you, I mean, your travel time will be about four to five minutes. And if you take Jaffna Airport as an international airport, the travel, from Chennai, the travel time is less than 20 minutes. So that 20 minutes is all time that board officials will have to go through all these volumes of data and see whether this is what need to be done with each and every passenger in that aircraft. So which is practically not possible without the aid of technology. Even with the aid of technology, that can be difficult. So, so however that is implemented, I'll explain some how it is, uh, in certain cases, how it is done. So when the decision is taken, so we call the pre clear decision because the passenger Passengers not arrived at the airport, but before the passenger comes, the decision is taken. The decision could be either to facilitate him to go for a seamless travel, or it could be a secondary inspection, which means that he has to go to a counter and he might be interviewed by an immigration officer or a customs officer for uh, to verify his travel intent and various things. Or it could be even in very drastic cases, it could be refusing entry to that particular country if they are compelling evidence that uh, the person is not admiss admissible to the country. So then uh, that decision will be conveyed to the frontline officers, either immigration, customs, or combined uh, frontline, and they will uh, act accordingly. And then the decision of that will also be collected again uh, to facilitate this risk mechanism. And usually, all these are handled by operations room, uh, which operates behind the screen and guide other agencies to act accordingly to doing that. And because that in that way also you can save that this data because the data will be seen only by one agency, particular agency. Because this risk-based targeting uh, mechanisms are, can be misused. Um, there's a recorded uh, uh, incident that happened in the United Kingdom actually. Uh, there was one immigration uh, board officer. I mean, his wife from, from, was from, 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 from India and he wanted to separate from his wife. So what he did was that the moment he, she went back to see her parents, he somehow entered an entry protecting her travel back to UK in the system, go illegal way. So that lady was not able to travel back and only after several years it was discovered that this was a fraud and not a genuine case. So likewise, these systems has to be built with a lot of security and safety safeguards to ensure that no one can misuse them. So that's also make another challenge into the system. Okay, now we deal with hundreds of passengers, right? So we have millions of passengers traveling every day or thousands of passengers in a small country. Only a few of them are potential targets. So the challenge is how do we identify these targets? Because if we can identify those targets, 
then very easily board officials can intercept them and interview them and take necessary action. But how do we identify them from thousands of people coming in? So typically, the, 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 the reasons for identifying targets will come from surveillance or intelligence information. And then officers will use that with the aid of technology, use that to identify potential targets, people who are potentially matching that uh, descriptions or the, those threats, and then take the appropriate action. So how do we identify them to use this large volume of data that comes there? Now, typically, there are two types of targets like that. One is what we call known targets. The other one is we call unknown targets. A known target is someone where the authorities knows that he is, is associated with something. Now, there are every country, will, you should have every border, will have a watch list, a list of passengers with their names, uh, passport numbers, etc. Uh, I mean, which they would allow them to come, but they would like to know that they are coming in and that they have entered the country due to various political law and other, other reasons. And sometimes the, the, these names may not be very complete. It may not be only part of the name that is available. That's why sometimes even the innocent people get stopped at immigration borders being interviewed uh, because they have a matching name, right? something like that. And then there are preventive lists. I mean, people who are not admissible to that country who will uh, be, uh, be turned back at the airport. There are international databases like Interpol, uh, there's a database called Find Database. It has seven different databases, which includes Red List, etc. And also, not only for people, I mean, even for goods and uh, there's, there's a database of stolen work of art uh, and historical artifacts. And there's another database of stolen vehicles. I mean, because in, in, in land borders, I mean, store, smuggling stolen vehicles is a very uh, common thing. In some countries, even smuggling cattle is, is a very big business, in, especially between uh, Bangladesh and India. So they, they maintain various databases of those things, where it happens, I mean, who, who are involved, etc. But they are very specific information. And also, I mean, US has the, the, the transport uh, secretary agency has the no-fly list, I mean, who are not allowed to travel in aircraft. So all these lists are available. Typically, when you check in, you are guaranteed to be checked against at least three or four of these databases, whether you are uh, in, in all those. So, but these are easy to handle because we have the database, we have the passenger record, we simply do a match, and if they are matching, then you are in that channel for uh, further processing. The unknown targets are the difficult ones. Unknown target means that we don't know specifically. I mean, we only have a profile of a person. We know that this type of a person might be might be harmful to uh, the receiving country, but we don't know exactly how who is, what features, because we have a very vague picture. And that is the new threat that we are facing. Here. A person who would come as a vis through visit visa and then uh, overstay and then uh, let's say uh, get employment in that country legally is someone like that. Because we don't know exactly who it is until he comes and starts working. I mean, even in Sri Lanka, that happens. I mean, there are rough uh, regional countries, uh, I mean, especially the IT industry. They come here in visit visa, take about three months visa, work in companies, and then go back. Because companies also sometimes like to employ them because they don't ask for any benefits. I mean, they work day and night, uh, no, no benefit, no health benefits, nothing. Uh, so that's cheap labor for them. So how do we identify this kind of thing? So all this work that we have done are actually on that category. I mean, the, the, the known target category is, it has been there for some um, lot of time, and it is not a difficult thing. So if you are looking for something unknown, it's like searching for a needle in a haystack. What do you do? Either you can search the entire haystack, right? Or you can have a little bit of a smarter way. You can use a magnet to attract all the metal objects and then select those shortlisted metal objects to do that. Now, finding an exact type of a needle might not we might be more efficient to be more efficient to be done by an expert who knows what we are looking at. But searching for the metal objects in the haystack is something that can be automated. So that's the balance between human intervention and automation that is used in the smart borders. So the idea is that we build risk profiles. So once you build risk profiles, we can check that risk profile against the incoming data. And if whenever there's a match, you can identify them as the first stage, a potential target, not exactly target because Everyone matching the risk profile may not be a type of person that, I mean, they may be coming for legitimate reasons. So that can become a potential target. So basically what are, what are used as 
I mean, uh, risk profiles, right? I mean, what uh, parameters are being used as risk profiles? It, it might include your biographic data, bio attributes, your age, gender, because certain type of uh, offenses or certain type of event, uh, threats are associated with certain gender, certain age groups, etc. Right? And it might involve your details of your personal details, your family details, your friends' details, etc. And also, it might lead your connectivity, uh, various connections, your associated with organizations, uh, uh, your political associations, uh, your nationality, your type of travel document, where the travel document is issued, and even where you have purchased the ticket, because some certain agents, travel agents, uh, certain hotels are known to be supporting these criminals based on historical data. So even sometimes where you purchase your ticket might affect your admissibility into a country. And then also your associations, dynamic association, your social media profiles, your travel partners with whom you travel, or whether you, uh, and even which ally to travel, all those things might be used as parameters in your risk profiles. And when also, but defining risk profile is not an easy task. It, it requires a lot of expertise, a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, effort by board officials. So, so the risk, uh, typically a risk profile is a collection of attributes. I mean, these attributes uh, defined in a probabilistic term. So, for example, a person in an age between 2 to 30 years, 20 to 30 years, could be a risk parameter, but not everyone in that age is a, is a risk parameter. So, it, 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 there's a probability associated with that which needs to be combined to get the final target. And Profiles are not linked to any individual or because we are not targeting any person. If you know a specific person to be target, it's a known target. It's not an unknown target. And they are defined, and also they need to be defined in actionable individuals. I mean, once you detect them, once you find them, there should be some action, because you can't simply watch and say that, I mean, this person is coming. There should be some action associated with that. And then also, targeting is looked at, I mean, usually defined for small groups. Now, for example, if you take Canada, now, uh, this is handled by an agency called Canadian Border Security Agency, CBSA. So, uh, they, their target is that per day, they are only looking at about between 25 to 50 targets from the entire Canadian border, considering the hundreds of thousands of people who cross the border. So, these profiles have to be very accurate, very precise in that context, as well as they have to be fuzzy and probabilistically driven. And more importantly, most importantly, actually, they have to be explainable and traceable back. Because one question that everyone is asking these days, why do you need to go through this profiling? Why can't you use AI to do that? Machine learning to do that. I mean, you have historical data. Why can't you train a model so that we should get this data and say, okay, this person is a high risk or a low risk person. But the issue is that these determinations end up in quotes. I mean, in most countries, if a person is there, I mean, stopped by immigration or customs, he has a right to know why he was stopped. I mean, some countries do not exercise that, but in most countries, that is the case. I mean, if you are stopped by a police officer, you can ask why you, why you were stopped. Right? And also, uh, so in some cases, you can even go to a law enforcement agency and say, ask them, what, what, what do you know about me? I mean, they have, they have to disclose everything. So if you have a system which works inside a black box, and tell that this person is good or bad, I mean, that doesn't work with that uh, requirement, right? So, when a per so whatever the risk targeting that happens, the profile has to be traceable back and say, okay, you were stopped because of this particular reason, and this is why you were stopped. So, even though we can use modern technology of, of I mean, various uh, analytics, etc., I mean, we need to be able to convert them into simple rules that can operate in the border and simple rules that can be explained because the passenger is not expert in like I mean when he asks why you were stopped you can't say you had a particular 75 percent probability of being rule number one two three or something like that you have to tell that okay you were a suspect of smuggling something in your bag and that's why you were stopped so it has to be explainable and traceable back to uh, the sources and origins as well now before uh, let me also show some examples uh, of a risk profile now for example uh, Take a hill place, right? I mean, uh, some data will come from statistics, some data will come from intelligence, I mean, awareness, surveillance, etc. Surveillance might say that, okay, there are this particular country which is considered to be high risk for COVID, let's say Ebola, right? High risk country. So if the passenger is coming from that country, he's high risk. Otherwise, he is not, right? If country of origin is from there, he's high risk. Or, and if he's vaccinated, again, he's low risk. I mean, he might come from high risk country, but he's vaccinated. 
and then purpose of travel. I mean, if he's coming for any official purpose or uh, visiting his family, then the risk is low because he will not mix with many people. But if he's trying for a holiday or vacation, then the risk is high. This is an example, right? Uh, so, and also if he has recently traveled to other countries, I mean, he may be back. He may not be having any symptoms, but if he has traveled to some other country, he might get start getting symptoms in Sri Lanka. So, so this, by looking at this kind of analysis, we can build some rules. And also, that is from surveillance or intelligence. And also, we can build rules based on statistical data. I mean, for, not for health risk per se, but in certain cases, by looking at historical data, we can also extract certain rules and define those risks. And once you define this risk, that can be applied with a potential mitigation action. Similar way, you can define another uh, rule for people who are coming for work here uh, without you know, not going into details of this. And also sometimes uh, risk profiling can also be done from various uh, architect, um, various art uh, articles, etc. Now, for example, a new site article might have someone statement saying that how we manage to uh, smuggle out of the country to some sort of a human smuggler or something like that. By looking at this, you can find people, places, etc. And then you can build up this link. Right? I mean, a person who will link with another person, he may be associated with a particular place of military meeting and certain uh, office of certain uh, travel agent likewise. So you can build up. So this is again another tool that board officials can use to build up this risk profile. Now, once we have the risk profiles, the next step is to apply them. So, the, so we usually use a two-layered approach. The first one is done at the pre-clearance stage, where we have the risk profiles, then we apply the risk profiles on the passenger data and detect potential matches. So they are potential targets, not exact targets, potential matches. This is done by a system, because we deal with, we deal with millions of data items and million, hundreds of thousands of profiles. So matching is done within a very short time using a system. And then those are presented to some experienced officers who will shortlist, go through the shortlisted list and decide whether to whether you need some action at the airport or not. In most of the time, this, this will be clear because they, when they look at the surround, they look at your Facebook profile, various things, and they find, okay, this is not the person that, uh, uh, this type of person, he's an innocent person, so he will clear the target and let him go. But if they need some action at the border, you will be stopped. So if you are stopped at the Canadian border, US border, UK border when you travel, uh, when you are genuine, right? It's not because they are suspecting you, because most likely the system has detected some someone matching you has done something bad, bad in that area. Because of that, you have been stopped. So to do this, we need a system, right? So this is the typical uh, structure of a uh, I mean, targeting system, right? Which will collect a lot of data, right? Because there will be multiple data sources coming from airlines, airports, uh, immigration, customs, uh, various sources. And then all this data has to be aggregated and build up a profile, traveler profile. And then also there will be different agencies who would define those risk profiles like what we mentioned earlier. And these risk profiles will then again go into a uh, repository where a rule engine will do the matching. And this rule engine has to operate on a fuzzy basis because you can't do exact matches. So it is uh, operating on a passive basis, and then shortlist people who are uh, uh, who should be targeted, right? And before actually physically targeting them, there will be a series of experience officers who would go through their profiles and see whether this person is actual target or not. And if he's actual target, then action will be taken. So everything up to this point happens on the background behind the scene. So what you see is only the tip of the iceberg, which happens here. But there's a lot of people, a lot of involved, a lot of technology that involves at the background in doing that. So this is how the systems operate. So let me also talk about some of the things which I have involved in this particular domain in doing that. Actually, my involvement came from this risk profiling part mostly. Uh, uh, the innovative came from that area. And actually, that started from my, as Chandan mentioned earlier, my PhD research, where we were trying to recognize people's uh, facial expressions. Uh, from single mugshot face image. At that time, this, this was in the early 2000s, so the computing power and the AI technologies were not developed as today. Uh, so at that time, the state of the art technology was uh, using a technique called facial action coding system uh, coming from the medical background, where uh, people code certain uh, movements of facial muscles, eyes, uh, 
facial muscles, the mouth, etc. And using this code, uh, set of codes as a vector, feature vector, uh, they apply a classifier, could be neural network or other uh, or even statistical classifier to determine what are the expressions. So our approach was rather than going through the facial action coding system, why can't we get the face image as itself as a, uh, as a, as a feature vector and based on that, how do we the classification? And when we do that, one thing we, uh, we were interested about was that now, when we classify someone's emotions or uh, expressions, it's a very subjective thing, right? I mean, we might see some person, one person might say he's sad, the other person may say he's, no, he's, he's neutral, he's not sad, right? So it's subjective, it's not very driven in hard rules. So how do we build this subjectivity into uh, the neural network that we do? So to do that, we came up with a new neural network architecture, what we call, we named it as cloud basis function. The main advantage was that it's, it's derived, it was derived from the radial base function networks. The, uh, the main idea was that it, it has a solid probabilistic background, theoretical background. So RBF networks allow you to be allowed you to define the network in terms of the probabilities of the input domain. So we extended that into larger dimension and created a, uh, a mechanism which where these initial probabilities can even be determined automatically. So that's the essence of what we did. And when we did that, we found that it has many other applications. Right? For example, since the network defines probabilities, we can then back translate those probabilities into truths because we know what are the events and what are the probabilities that, that are associated with those three events. And based on the events and probabilities, we can define truths. So which means that this network can not only say someone is happy or not, we can also say why he said. Why he looks at, right? Why he looks at. So that was also possible. That was also possible. And then this rule extraction became, I mean, I mean, this is something that can be applied into many domains. I mean, for example, in immigration, the CPM network might say, okay, this person is a bad person, and the, the rule extract, we can extract rules from that and then define rules why he is uh, something someone who will be interviewed. So that was the idea. So it has many applications. I mean, immigration is one thing. It can be used for vetting of uh, government service applications. Uh, any Anything where the risk-driven decision-making process is there and there's large order that, uh, which is driven by data, this can be applied. Then uh, the first application of this came from a different domain. Actually, in, uh, in uh, around 2010, uh, I was asked to examine a large collection of photographs and videos uh, uh, appearing in various websites, etc. Aftermath of the civil conflict that we had in Sri Lanka, uh, people were using them against propaganda against, and most of these images were, I mean, manipulated. I mean, I just combined, uh, edited all these things, and they were being quoted at various forums, international forums, and the government wanted to create a database saying that okay, select these images and say where they have been edited, etc. So there were over 120,000 still images and about 2,000 hours of video. Doing it manually was not uh, a practical possible thing. So we tried to use the CBF uh, concept. Uh, I mean, develop certain indicators, uh, input feature vectors, and then probabilities associated with that, and then reverse map into uh, the images so that we can at least tell, I mean, at the initial screening, why this image looks like being modified. So after that, expert can further analyze that image and give the exact reason. So this was presented, uh, used in uh, uh, to uh, safeguard the country in the, uh, against certain allegations made at the United Nations Human Rights Council. In fact, I went there in March 2022 and presented the evidence, and also it appeared in the uh, LLRC report uh, for uh, the Census and Reconstruction Report appointed by the president at that time. Uh, then uh, the next application in, in civil work uh, was the Sri Lanka DTA. Uh, this was an immigration. Uh, uh, so prior to 2011, we had a free visa policy. I mean, uh, people from 82 nationalities could come to Sri Lanka without any visa, and at the airport they were given visa uh, if they come as tourists, right? So when we were to host the World Cup, Cricket World Cup 2011, I mean the security was tightened up. Uh, Interpol came here, and they were looking after security, and they said this practice is not good. Because anyone can come, any terrorist can come, especially looking at the, the background, civil war, etc. I mean, there's no way that you can prevent. So they wanted to introduce visa system so that they get prior approval before they come. But that request was uh, faced with a heavy uh, criticism from the tourism sector, and the other people said that okay, if you do that, tourists won't come here. 
and we need to provide freedom. So this uh, issue was the immigration was facing this issue, and at uh, that time they were looking for a solution. So uh, after a lot of deliberations, uh, a decision was made to go for online visa application. And at that time, no country in the world was giving online visa. The main reason was that when you apply online, you don't know who is. Right? Um, the, the, the information sources that we have today were not there. I mean, there were no popular Facebook profiles. There were no other profiles. So someone applies, you submit a photograph, give some name, passport number. You don't know whether it's his passport or someone else's passport, and you have a good decision. No country was doing that, but we had to do that because we didn't have any other option because we didn't have embassies throughout the world. And this was a huge economic uh, game to Sri Lanka. We couldn't avoid. So, so looking at all of these things, these were set as the requirement for the project. For visitors, you should be able to apply on uh, at his own convenience, right? I mean, there was an idea that, okay, we'll ask them to go to nearest embassy or certified agent and apply, but that was not uh, considered viable because in most countries. So they had to apply at their own convenience. And there's no physical submission of document. Every, everything that you submit should be scanned, document or type entered into the system. Um, it should be available online. Even the immigration is not, uh, the back office is not operating online 24 by 7, but people should be able to apply at any time at any convenience. And this should also provide them uh, planning their travel. And for the government side, I mean, uh, the main idea was to get this advanced information uh, of people who are coming into the country because the relevant security agencies could go through that information and take necessary security precautions for the cricket tournament. And also, it, it, uh, it, 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 it would streamline the visa application process because if it is a success, that might continue on there. And that also can be used for intelligence-driven border control because now we are collecting a lot of information in advance, etc. And also, the, uh, the government was not financially strong at that time also. So, I mean, they wanted to be a very cost-effective solution as well. So, considering this, we start, I mean, decision was taken to go for e-visas. But that, again, had challenges from the local side, I mean, the Department of Immigration. Now, at that time, they were automated. I mean, their passport issuance, uh, border was automated. But that system was done in 2000, early 2000, uh, 2005, 2003 period. And that was not a system designed to operate with the internet. I mean, so closest. All the security infrastructure and everything was designed to be operated by the officers only. It was not designed to be operated to the external world. So with this, we have to open it to the external world. So we need to look for an alternative approach to do that. And many systems that were in the system, uh, department were not compatible with modern internet technology as well. Right? And also administrative procedures. Now, when you apply online, you need to have a guaranteed response time. The, the control general at that time said that, okay, you can, I can allow you to do that, but we must guarantee whether approval or decline should go within to the applicant within a certain time period. I mean, there, there should be a response going that way. So how do that? I mean, whether we can automate this, because automation also not well accepted by government officials because they, many officials uh, enjoy their authority. They don't want the computer to take a decision on behalf of them. Right? I mean, also there are legal barriers. I mean, certain regulations, certain enactments says that someone has to sign. I mean, so physical signature is required because the, the act has been drafted about 50 years ago. Right? So it says physical signature is required. And then also how do we handle the work? Because World Cup was coming. A lot of people were coming. So how we handle the work? Because in online, it is even difficult because it is a physical application. The queue itself will be regulated. People will win. When, when you see the long view, you go back and come on different But when you apply online, you do it at your convenience. Right? You don't look at what the officer is overloaded or not. Right? So we need a mechanism to do that. Looking at all of this, we designed this two-tired process. What we did was that we separated all IT operations and frontline operations from the department. Because immigration department is the administrative department. It's not the best place to run an IT system. It's not the best place to run a website. So what we decided, all the things, front-end things, running the website, running the services at the front-end, acceptance of applications, etc., we will separate and give it to a professional IT company who can do it, a service provider. And they will charge a fee, but when we calculated, that was much more effective. For example, this is the call center. We did a calculation, and if you have to run the call center within the department, you need to have 10 seats working for 24 hours, at least three shifts per day, train those people, and then have backup staff for, uh, for the, when they go on leave and everything, when you add all those costs together, it was much cheaper to 
get it outsourced from a professional call center operator. So based on that, the front end of the application, receiving the application, because one thing we wanted was that even though the department has a huge workload, the applicant should not feel that. They should be able to submit and get, get a status back. So that was separated and outsourced to uh, the service provider, but the cooperation of decision making was kept within the department. And this also allowed the 24 by 7 operation because this front end could operate 24 by 7, but the back end could operate only 8 to 5 in normal days. Right? But people will not feel that because they can still submit the application and get the status back as well. And they can even contact the uh, first level of support from the uh, call center also. I mean, this is not new today. I mean, everyone is doing this, but at that time, this was something new. And in fact, I think this is the first time in Sri Lanka we, uh, that kind of situation was operating. And to then do the to deal with the large volume of applications, that's where my research came in. Uh, now, we had a role engine. We have a profiling system. That was the first profiling system in Sri Lanka, uh, to my, based on my knowledge. And uh, so when the applicant submit the details, the system will automatically apply risk rules and then divide the application to three channels, what called the red, green, and the amber channel. Green channel will be the applicants who are determined to be bona fide travelers, good travelers. right? So their applications went through a very straightforward path. Of course, there's a calculator risk, but the, the department took that risk and it went through a very straightforward path. Still, there was an officer who simply clicked that button and approved because by law, it was uh, required that someone need to approve it. You, you could not completely delegate that to a computer because of the law. So change in the regulations was not, uh, not an option at that time. So they decided to give one officer who simply do the approval for those things. But approval was automatically done by the system. And then we have the red channel where you are flagged at a very high risk. And we are unit further investigation sometimes refers to other department, uh, intelligence services, police, etc., to get their clearance, etc. Very few applications. Our initial target was about 75% of the applications would be in this channel, and about 1% of the application will be this channel. The balance will be on the Amber channel, where officers will physically look at their document uh, and uh, on, on the online submission, basically inspect the online submission and decide what to do. Right? So balance about 24%, 23% will go here. So we defined that and uh, all the payments are automated, etc. And this system was a huge success. Within one first 100 days of operation, it cleared 373,705 uh, applications. Within 100 days, using the same set of uh, same staff working between 8 to 5, without any overtime or anything like that. Right? And it reduced the processing time from 7 days to 3 hours for green child applicants. Typically, it took uh, seven days for everyone to get a visa, I mean, the minimum at that time, and it came down to three hours um, uh, for green channel applicants. That's And, and the number of applicants were about 78% uh, in the green channel. We expected about 75, but it was 78%. Now, <clears throat> so to define this, now, when we did this, uh, we wanted to define the initial rule base here, because that was a really a challenge, because the reason is the rules were there, not in books, but in people's minds. I mean, see, there were senior officers working in embassies, etc. They know how to get an application. They know how to take a digital application. But if you ask them to explain those rules, I mean, they find it a bit difficult to explain. And that comes from their experience. So, but on the other hand, we had a huge database operating from 2003 uh, of people who are coming in, who have been uh, prosecuted, who have been, uh, uh, I mean, uh, not allowed to enter and various things. So we used that database, ran the network architecture on that one, and that gave us the initial set of rules which these officers were fine-tuning after. So that was the area that research was used. So this project uh, uh, was recognized internationally, actually. Um, actually, we presented this in the International Border Management Conference in Thailand in 2012. Uh, and when we presented that, it was the first time that a complete paperless, 100% paperless visa system was being presented. And uh, everyone was very, I mean, not very happy about that at that time, the, the idea whether we can be done, do, done, done or not. But when we went back again in 2016, uh, more than 12 countries were uh, adapting similar systems since the same concept was adopted by more than 12 countries. And now it is more or less a de facto standard for uh, electronic visa process. And also, this was awarded the world, uh, at the World Summit of Awards uh, in Thailand in 2013, if I remember, yeah, 2013 as the best uh, project in, in e government uh, category, which in, it, since it impacted a lot. Uh, uh, I mean, a lot of people uh, throughout the globe, uh, uh, a lot of people throughout the globe, this is another 
system was the return case management system, which went, which started from Sri Lanka and went to global. Um, now, return case management is like this. Now, when uh, I mean countries, for example, Sri Lankans go outside. I mean, they 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 overstay in other countries. I mean, either they go illegally or they overstay in other countries. Now, international law, according to international law, if a person is found to be staying in your country without authorization, uh, I mean, you are you are bound to send him back to his country of origin, right? No, no other place would to country of origin, right? And to do that, you need to find what the country of origin. So most of these illegal immigrants, as soon as they go, what they do is that they throw away their passport and throw away all their traces of identity and everything. So they are there, they don't speak English, they seem to not speak English. And when they get caught, the country, let's say in Italy, they can't find from where they claim Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, because we all look like it. So mm -hmm. they show India, for them, we all look like it. So, but on the other hand, uh, they also have their own legislation. For example, in Italy, if you get a person, uh, if you get detain a person, you can detain only up to 72 hours. If you can't find from where he is within that 72 hour period, uh, I mean, uh, then you have to release him. And you can't, again, uh, catch him for the same offense. You have to wait until he makes some other offense to catch him. So, uh, so that, and also, it, it, these people were sometimes burned to death side. For example, even to detain them, even in countries where they can be detained for a long period, that's expense. And most of the taxpayers on those countries don't want their tax money to be spent on these people. Now, for example, an average in the European Union, to uh, detain an illegal immigrant in a detention center, per day, they, their cost is about 200 euros. Because they need to be provided, because they are not criminals, right? I mean, they need to be provided with various facilities, uh, EV, or treatment, various things. So that cost. And that's a huge burden. So what these countries have done is that from this source country, the other destination countries, source countries like Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, and those countries, they have signed what are called readmission agreements. And they say that, okay, we will give you certain dates, certain grants, certain uh, funding, or certain scholarships or whatever. But to do that, you need to have a mechanism to get your illegal immigrant back to your country. Efficient. Basically, they are asking for a system where if a person is found in Italy and he's suspected to be uh, Sri Lanka, the Italian government need a mechanism to contact Sri Lankan government and ask him to get him back. But before getting him back, we need to verify whether he's actually Sri Lankan. Because there are a lot of Bangladesh star people, Indian, Indians, who show that they are Sri Lankans because they think that coming to Sri Lanka is better than going back to their own countries. Okay. So, and also for Italy, they need to, I mean, uh, figure out to which country they need to be requested. I mean. So this readmission agreement systems are made for that. Uh, so, but the, you can't do it manually. Doing it manually is not efficient, going to embassy and doing it manually. So you need a system. So actually, a UN came up with the idea here, and we designed a system called the RCM, so the Admission Case Management System, which is a cross-border workflow management system, where uh, the system is hosted, let's say, Sri Lanka one is hosted, was hosted in Sri Lanka, and we give access to European Union countries, and they can make a request. They can submit, I mean, through the system, they can make an initial guess of which nationality this person is, Based on that, they submit whatever information they have included in their photograph, the language spoken, the way they understand various information. And then in the source country, they verify that information. And then if he's a nationality of the source country, they will issue a temporary travel document to bring him back. Right? So this system was uh, done in Sri Lanka first. And, but doing this was not easy, especially in automation, because we were trying to match, match apples and oranges. The culture they are, the work environment there is completely different from what we do here, right? And the most significant problem was with the data protection because they have very strong data protection. I mean, they, you can't, you know, for example, in Germany, you are a government officer cannot ask what religion, the, cannot ask the question what religion you are following from a person. I mean, it's illegal, right? So they have data protection that they can't disclose those data, right? But if you look at our countries to take the decision, we need that data. And so this matching these data protection requirements was a huge challenge in doing this exam. So what we did was that we came up with the idea where we divided the system into two segments, work into two process segments, what we call it the front process segment, the back process segment. And in between, we put a strong control mechanism to control the amount of data being transmitted. Now, this is not about security. Security was done in standard protocols, but this is to that what data attributes need to be shared with the other party under what circumstances. And the system has to decide that. Right? 
So we built this system for Sri Lanka. And with that, we also introduced a new concept, which is again now being used pretty much in the immigration domain throughout the world. We call it data classification and exposure control framework. We define this framework. So under that, what we do is uh, we get all the data attributes that we can collect, and then we classify them into different classes, say class A, B, C, and D. And then we have a mechanism of exposure control saying that what class can, which class can be uh, shared with which agency under which circumstances. That matrix is defined based on, and it is fully automated, and based on that, the data sharing happens. So this system was done for Sri Lanka in 2000, started work in 2015, we finished in 2017. And after that, the European Union took this as a model system, and they took this project, and now they are implementing it in many other countries. All, across all 28 European members, 27 uh, European member states, and all the countries uh, who are source countries for migrants from there. Uh, we completed the installation in Bangladesh. They are operating it right now. Right now, we are implementing in Gambia and Azerbaijan. Uh, next year, I'll be a few South African countries uh, targeted. Uh, likewise, this will be implemented over altogether over 30 countries. Uh, so they are taking Sri Lanka an example as a model and now being implemented. Uh, then also uh, uh, the, the risk management engine, I can't talk too much about this, but the risk management engine that we defined is now operating in Sri Lanka uh, under Ministry of Defense. Uh, so this is a picture of the center that uh, handles the risk management. Uh, uh, and I'm happy to say that this entire solution was designed in Sri Lanka, built in Sri Lanka, not, I mean, just funded by the Australian Canadian government. They gave the grants. Uh, but we said we don't need the system, give us the money, and uh, through UA, uh, we developed in local Sri Lanka, local IT companies developed it. It's being used here, but it's effective for almost two years now. Uh, and, and also, Sri Lanka is the only South Asian country to have this kind of a situation, and one of the very few South uh, Asia Pacific countries to have a system like this. We are in par with most of the developed countries in terms of risk management in our world. So uh, that's all uh, about the work I have done. Uh, so I thought uh, I, I'm also going to tell a little bit about me also, right? So I am from an era of uh, not having internet, right? I mean, YouTube or Facebook or computer games in the late, uh, late 80s, right? But we enjoy traveling in football of buses and playing cricket in road, right? Almost every day. And I studied in school. I did. I selected maths because I wanted to become a mechanical engineer. I, mean, I never wanted to become a computer engineer at that time. In fact, I had not seen it. When, until I became uh, in my old years, I had not, not even seen a computer, right? Real computer, audio pictures and TV. I have seen it. Uh, I wanted to become a mechanical engineer because that was my interest. But uh, our IT uh, teacher at school, at uh, Royal College, uh, Ms. Jellaya, we call uh, Chile because it's very tough. Uh, I mean, she motivated uh, me to do some computing on a single spectrum at that time. And then that changed. And also, after it was, we were at uh, home for about two and a half years because of the civil issues, uh, troubles that we had. And certain events during that time pushed me into computer engineering. Uh, so when I came to university, we were in the direct intake. So I applied for computer engineering and got selected in the department. And Myself going, getting into border management domain was an accident, actually. Uh, I was uh, at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong uh, people, and they asked me whether I can help them in that one. So I said, yes, and it's out. I mean, after my, most of my work was in that domain after that, actually. Um, in my free time, actually, I like to make things, but often end up in breaking things rather than making uh, or doing halfway through. So what you see on the right-hand side is my our house at my house, my place, my home. Uh, during the COVID, uh, during the power crisis, uh, we uh, built a small, uh, I would say, nano grid because it, it has multiple power sources. It has a generator, and these batteries are all discarded batteries from hybrid vehicles and various other lithium ion batteries. I also have the desi batteries. You can see them here. So I built up a uh, solu small solution uh, which can combine these different battery uh, chemistries with the different voltages, charging algorithms, etc. And then use solar power. I had solar power at that time, so combine that with, uh, and we never had power cuts at home. During even the 14 hour power cuts, we had minimum power to uh, take our basic needs. And this also had some innovative things. Uh, for example, I had limited capacity in battery, so I can't, I could not run the entire thing. So I had to decide on which people, which, which service to be powered through battery and which should be shut down. So I had a Arduino and ESP board which talked to internet, get Google weather uh, service, 
and predict what would be the weather tomorrow, how much sunlight I'm going to get, and based on that, decide on how much of battery power to retain in the system. So it worked fine. I'm mean, still it's working. I mean, still, uh, we are not depending on the CEG for power right now. Uh, like that. So personally, I like to be hands-on person. I would say I hate administrative work, paperwork, etc. President has knows about that, right? So anything hands-on, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, always ready. But if you ask me to write a report or write or something like that, that won't happen. Uh, yesterday, I got, got a call saying that I have not submitted my increment forms in 2016, and he wanted me to submit, so that, that's the nature. Oh. And uh, that's what I mean. At that time, I suggested him, okay, let's, why don't we have an online system? That uh, I mean, why do we have to feel that uh, the repeating details every time we submit? I mean, why can't we have a system where we, we get the common details and, and we can work on that, right? Uh, and, and then fill out on, on the required information and get it automated, right? And something like that. But I think what we need is a we need a re-engineering. If we try to automate what is manually done here, we'll never reach that. We need to re-engineer the process. So thank you for being with me for I think more than one hour now. Uh, so all this work uh, uh, was possible because of I had additional support and tolerance from my wife and my daughter. And also I would like to uh, mention three names, three individuals uh, uh, who helped me. Uh, I mean who I mean who took who was not. Uh, I mean, afraid to take risks because when we introduced these things in immigration, that was something coming from nowhere. They never knew me. I mean, I, in fact, we met in an official function and they, they said they have this problem in a lunch table discussion and I suggested this can be done and that's how it started actually. Uh, so they took the risk and they were, I mean, good enough to implement that actually. Stay behind, I mean, work behind that and implement it. One is Mr. Shantha Kurasekar, he's a head of migration from uh, UN, uh, migration is IUM, and he took uh, efforts to get all the funding grants required for this uh, and provide this knowledge to this. And then also Mr. Chunanath Pekra, who was the, uh, the chief of chief immigration control at the immigration department at that time. Uh, I mean, he took decisions, I mean, he was ready to take risk, get everything and go for this new technology and also Mr. Nihar Ranasinghe, uh, who was the uh, controlled IT at that time and now he's the Minister of Secretary of, uh, Secretary of the Ministry of Education. I mean, without these three people, uh, most of the work which I described here would not have happened. I mean, so, I mean, because of them, the, so they, I mean, they need to thank uh, appreciation for that as well. So, thank you very much. Thank you. That was a really a pleasure listening to Professor Chantara. So, with that, uh, may I invite uh, Professor Gyan Dais to hand our speaker a small moment. Thank you, sir. Very really interesting. Thank you. Uh, with that, the 21st inaugural lecture comes to an end. Uh, but let me take one minute in thanking our sponsors. Um, Cargill's the event sponsor, the Daily FT, the print media sponsor, and the Sri Lankan scientist, our social media sponsor. And with that, I'm thanking all who joined online as well as here physically. And again, now having interviews, another professor from University of Moratua to the public. We close today's session and thank you all. Have a good day.